Welcome to the Ending Sexploitation Podcast, where we decode sexual harm and provide you with active solutions. I'm your host, Kaylee McNamara. All right, everyone. I'm so happy to start today's podcast getting to speak with Alvin Winford. And Alvin is a dear friend um, who we've been able to work together and continue to collaborate together. He has over 18 years of experience working on anti-exploitation in Africa, and he's currently the program manager at the African Network for the Prevention and Protection Against Child Abuse and Neglect in Liberia. And I'll add a link to his uh, nonprofit in the show notes as well, so you can check them out and support them. Uh, He's also a 2019-2020 Fulbright Fellow sponsored by the U.S. Department of State. And while he was in the U.S. over that time, he was a fellow with us in Washington, D.C. at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. So we got to know each other in person, and now we collaborate over Zoom like this. So it's always wonderful to catch up and continue to work with him. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat today, Alvin. Thank you so much, Holly. It's my pleasure being with you this afternoon. Well, great. Well, now you have such extensive experience in fighting sexual abuse in so many different forms. I'd love to maybe first hear, how did you first feel called to start working on these issues? Hi, uh, thank you again. Uh, I, I was raised by a single mother in, in a rural Liberian village. And being raised by a single mother, you, you are sided with the issue of uh, maid dominions, uh, the issue of cultural, harmful cultural practices. So looking at some of the issues that I, I saw my family going through and also other members of the community, I felt that I owe it not only to my family, but also to the community and also to Africa to serve as a voice in ensuring that children are protected against all forms of abuse. Uh, in our kind of society, it's, it's, it's very rare to see a male champion the issue of children. In most instances, you'll find the women and girls talking about children issues. So I wanted to break the gene. And by breaking the gene, I've not been able to serve as a catalyst to influence other males as, as partners against uh, child abuse. Oh, that's so wonderful. And it, and it is so true all over the world, I think. I go to events um, you know, focused on protecting kids or fighting abuse, and it's almost all women. So you, you're a great example to, to men everywhere to get involved. <laughs> Um, now, and your organization in Liberia is focused really, as the name says, on protecting children from abuse. I, um, maybe you could share what are some of the trends, whether it's culture or economy or policies going on in Liberia right now that make children vulnerable? Like what's making children vulnerable to sexual abuse or to sex trafficking? Yeah, certainly, like really almost everything that you talk about combination, but I'll, I'll try to explain each component. So the very first one we need to look at is the issue of uh, harmful cultural practices. Uh, Liberia is one of the many African countries. Yeah, we, we, we have been able to graduate for, uh, to, to an era where children issues are not being brought on the national agenda. But largely, I will also say that Children rights, especially the issue of sexual abuse is being carried out, is occurring simply because of harmful cultural practices. Mm-hmm. Uh, traditionally, children as young as um, 13, 14 are getting married. So that's a cultural issue. Uh, then the, the other one is that uh, when one is sexually abused in certain culture in Liberia, yeah, the, for the fear of stigmatization, not to shame the family name, uh, that is also not reported. And when it's not reported, the perpetrator sees that as, an, as a solace so that they can continue to perpetrate sexual violence against children. Uh, another key issue is the issue of uh, poverty. We, 
Liberia remains one of the poorest countries in Africa and here in the world. Uh, so in most instances, some family members, because due to their vulnerability, uh, they serve as, as an accomplice to their children being sexually abused. So for instance, you have some young girls growing up 15, 16 years, uh, the family members tend to look up to them to support them. So what they don't have education, they don't have skills, they are not working. What else are they going to do to, 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 to bring money home, to buy food, uh, you know, to take care of a renter? So the family see nothing wrong when children or these young people are sexually abused. So that is, that is a very key issue. So economic issue is very key. So in other, in other words, the way to address that is sometimes to, to, to ensure that you have social protection programs. By having social protection programs, all of the needs would not be met, but the basic needs would be met so that uh, these families can be protected. You have a safety net, so they will not be able to expose children to, to sexual violence. The other critical issue is the issue of policy. On paper, we, we have the RIP law, that is, you cannot have sexual intercourse with anybody below the age of 18. Any sexual interaction with anybody below the age of 18 is RIP. All right, so informed, the issue of informed consent there doesn't exist because they are children. That rape law is on paper, is helping us to some extent, but the issue has been policymakers, we have not been able, or policymakers have not been able to enforce it to the lighter. That is, we have issue with the court. Uh, we also have issue where we, we, we with, with, with the rehabilitation center. So that is also the critical problem. Uh, so what, what we think needs to be done in, in relating to this now is not only to talk about the laws and the policies, but how then we, can we be, we as campaigners, can we ensure that the policies maker can enforce this? So no one is protected when anyone violates the rights of children or have sex with children, you should be able, well, the penalty says that you go to jail for life. In most instances, very few cases, very few cases we have people going to jail for life. In other instances, they find their way out of the court system. It's almost like a cartel. And it is about time that that cartel has to be broken. And the only way it has to be broken is for policymakers to put their feet on the ground. We'll be going to election soon. So one of the issues I think that should be coming up is how then can we make those who are vying to be uh, elected either from the presidency or also in the legislature so that they can make a commitment where they will serve as allies in protecting children. If they do agree to that, then before communities should be able to elect them. Uh, then also we talk about the system issue. As we speak, we have a unit called the Women and Child Protection Unit. That women and child protection unit, their main duty or responsibility is to ensure that children are protected against all forms of violence. One of the major issues they are confronted with is the issue of sexual violence. That unit, they have been able to, to do some work. My organization and other line uh, civil society organizations have been able to work along with them, but they also have constraints. In terms of logistics, uh, in terms of capacity building, I'm not too sure they are up to the task. Yes, the willingness is there when you work along with them, but they have to be strengthened. Uh, then also we have uh, a center called the One Stop Center. At the One Stop Center, when rape occurs, there you should go without paying any money. You, you should be able to do medical examination because if you, medical examination is not taken within 72 hours, you lose evidence. So the one stop, stop center is there. We have very few one stop center. But at the one stop center, besides having the, the nurses and the doctors, you also have the social workers. Uh, then you have the psychosocial people, okay? Then you also have the police. Then you also have the, the lawyers who will also be able to assist when the case is being followed, is, be, is being pursued in court. Again, yes, we have few of that functioning, but generally, again, when I talk about system issue, that is an area that has to be strengthened so that uh, communities, fair 
and, and potential victims will have hope in the system. When they do, when there's hope within the system, then when violence takes place, people can be able to, to have access to justice. But in the absence of that, you know, when people know that there will be, when children know that, or parents know that their families will be sexually violated and nothing comes out of it, uh, it does not help the system at all. What it does is people see them in a system of apathy that yes, I'm already helpless. And that is all what the perpetrators want. They want to see a community, they want to see family members who will say, I will do nothing about it. In here in Liberia, number them, when you do not have any hope, all you can say, I leave it with God. Yes, we all believe in God, but God will not come down to address these kind of issues that we as humans, he has given us uh, the power and the resources that we can address. So when we can strengthen the, the system issue, I'm quite sure we can be able to do a lot. And the last one, I will talk about the issue of awareness. Yes, there are still communities and villages in Liberia that People, families, members, and children still do not know what children is your children's rights are or what child protection is all about. So it's about time that uh, we all can be able to go to the villages, to the hamlets, so we can enlighten children and family members so that they can be able to claim their rights. The cultural practice is still there that children were seen as property, you know, that they, they have rights, but these rights are limited. They should be controlled by adults. Now we have signed all of these conventions, like you as a signatory to the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child. We are a signature to the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. Then we also have our own children law, which more or less domesticated the UNCRC. And all of these protocols uh, bring to the fore that children, they are not properties, they are human beings, that their rights, they have to be protected. The issue now is how then can we be able to reach to the northern credit of Liberia in all villages so that children will be able to have information. By having this information, they will be able to challenge violators, uh, not negatively, but that will enable them to claim their rights against all forms of abuse. This is so fascinating because as you're going through all these very complex issues and how they all kind of feed into vulnerability or, you know, maybe lack of access to justice, something that really strikes me is how it, all of these trends are occurring all over the world, which is so, I mean, in some ways can be very depressing. I mean, you know, thinking about, oh, poverty being an issue, lack of in law enforcement of what the rules are on paper, or even lack of um, you know, uh, the legal system making, uh, making it right or fulfilling what they're supposed to do by the end of it. Just recently here in the United Kingdom, where I'm living right now in England, they had a study come out that I think it was 98% of people who sexually assault women are never uh, successfully prosecuted. They're not um, you know, put into jail or even fined or anything like that. So, you know, every, every region might have, you know, different aspects might be more of a problem at one time or another, but it is just crazy how it's these same problems that happen all yeah. over the world. Yeah. Hopefully that means that there are some similar solutions we can all find. Um, but exactly. Yeah which that that's probably the positive way to look at it. Um, another problem that continues around the world is the issue of child marriage. And I know globally UNICEF says that around 41,000 uh, child brides are married off every day around the world, uh, which is a huge number. I think that amounted to around 15 million a year. Uh, and so this is a topic that uh, most of our podcast listeners are Americans, but not all of them. Hello to those of you not, who are not Americans, but um, those many who are listening are Americans. And they might think that that doesn't really happen in the U.S., but it really does. I know there were at least 200 minors who were married in the U.S. Um, in like the last decade or so. And I know that you've also spoken publicly about child marriage and especially in 
like the Liberia context. Can you maybe explain uh, what the situation of child marriage, why it's happening, what, what you're seeing there? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, certainly. And just last year at the, at the conference, I was able to look at it from a global perspective. Yes, you are right. Uh, even in America, Europe, Asia, uh, the, the, the entire world is confronted with the issue of child marriage. But for the day that I'll be spending more specific on the, on the Liberian context. So in Liberia, I, children, uh, the children law clearly says that any sexual act against uh, anyone below the age of 15, uh, below the age of 18, that is rape, that is on people. That is what we use as an, our advocacy too. But the harsh reality is that children as young as 13, 14 years old are being given up into marriages with the acquiescence of their families, with their support of the community members. All right? So, and the reason that has been happening, there are a lot of contributing factors towards that. First of all, the issue of the culture. In Liberia, we have what they refer to as the Sunday society is almost like a traditional boys school, uh, very informal, where young girls are taken to, to be trained or mentor how to take care of homes, you know? So right after graduation at the age of 13, 14, when they come back, the next thing is they send them out to, to, to be given out as, as wives, you know? Mm -hmm. And you, those that they're giving out, they are not normally their ages, from the teen age range, they are people like me, people in their 40s, people in their 50s, in their 30s and what have you. So that leads to what further exploitation because what is happening over there, now is they'll just continue to rape them as they are raping them, they begin to have children. So children have children. So that also leads to another issue. That issue is these children who are getting Marry at this very early age, they do not have skills, as I talk about, they do not have education. So they will not be able to protect themselves, they will not be able to claim their rights. Mm. All right. Uh, the perpetrator, the man, in this instance, I, I prefer calling the perpetrator, will continue to, to control them. And because he controls them, he will have children with them. And these children that you're going to be having with them, they will also not be sent to school. So you're going to be having a vicious cycle of poverty. This little girl that was sent into marriage, she's living with this man who provides the food. So she has no voice, all right? Then besides that, the issue of life skills, she's not even prepared. She's, she's not in a position where she can take care of herself. You know, she medically, you know, uh, she doesn't even know what her gym practices are because she's still green. She is still a child, mm. you know? So that puts her in the situation to be more vulnerable to, to diseases. So in most instances, these children who are having children, sometimes, most instances, the worst case scenario is sometimes they die in childbirth, all right? Then besides, if you are lucky and you are able to have this child, the child will be malnourished because my will tell you that you have only one source of income, and that is from this perpetrator. You do not have means to take care of your own child. So the child is not well fed. The child doesn't have access to, to medical attention. So in most all our instances, the, before the child reaches the age of two or three, the child also dies. Mm. So that also compounded. That also leads to a, a psychological and emotional wound. I guess I have a child, and this child that I suffered so much for, I was denied the opportunity to go to school, but yet I was not, this child was not able to, to live throughout. So that's also an issue. All right, so that is at the community level. And then at the, at the system level, we have the Ministry of uh, Internet Affairs. The Ministry of Internet Affairs on paper, you know, every year we, we advocate for Zero tolerance against FGM, female genital mutilation. So our government has signed that. So every year we celebrate that. But on paper, they say, yes, we are not part of it. But beyond the scene, 
they are giving these traditional Bui schools certificates to operate. And the traditional Bui schools actually is a major source of child marriage because women and children come from there, the guys see that they are free now for, for adult food. Now, so that is the situation we have. So in Liberia, uh, most of the young mothers, they are between the ages of 15 to 20 to 24. So that tells you that people are having children even below the age of 15, uh, even below the age of 18. In most instances, when they have, when they get impregnated, they move the, to, the, to the home or to the apartment of the male counterpart. Some kind of marriage has taken place. Where the, the official marriage has not taken place, but some kind of marriage is taking place because they are living together and doing almost everything together, just like marriage couple. So that is also a major issue. Yes, we'll talk about issue of poverty, and that is in Liberia now you have young men, young guys who use, uh, who use motorcycles. I don't know you know much about the motorcycles. Easier means of transportation. So mm -hmm. these young guys, they don't go to school, all right? So all the learn is because they need money in their pocket, uh, they learn how to ride the motorcycles. And because it's the easier means of transportation here, yeah, they use that as a means to exploit young years. So because fam families are poor, they are not able to argue much or they're not able to claim their rights or they don't have the, the self-confidence to raise these issues. They allow that to happen and their children are taken away by, by the motorbikes people. Mm -hmm. Then the other one, which is, not help, uh, which is not exacerbating the issue of child marriage recently is the issue of COVID. Uh -huh. When there was COVID, uh, when COVID was announced like you in March last year, we found out that the schools were closed, you know? And one of the best, one of the protection tools for children to protect them against sexual violence and even physical violence to keep them in the school. You know, when they are in school, uh, the school environment helps to protect them. So when they come from school, they have their homework and their assignment that will engage them. But with COVID lockdown, what happened was children were just living in the communities. You know, they have no means to, 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 to service providers. So they breaks, they just live in the community and then people exploited them, you know, to come in, give them gifts and what have you. And most of them ended up becoming pregnant. The moment they become pregnant, some families, the moment you become pregnant in Liberia, uh, quote unquote, they don't want um, the family to be stigmatized that you have out of work loud and you're getting pregnant. So they give you out into wedding and into marriage, which also exacerbated this. So the issue of teenage pregnancies now is on the increase. The issue of uh, uh, teen teenage marriage is also on the increase. So because of the lockdown, and we had the experience when we had Ebola, you know, but apparently we did not learn our lesson. And COVID has just come now exacerbating it high school. Uh, in elementary school, they are not, they, they cannot go back to school now simply because they are not having babies and they, they are not getting married to, to, to older men and what have you. So the issue of teenage pregnancy is, is a very big social issue in Liberia, uh, which has a very thin line to, to teenage marriage. And teenage marriage, most society or most communities, feed, they don't feed, they don't see it as an abuse. They see it as a means where their children are going out, will be living with someone who will not be able to take care of them. So that means it reduces their economic constraints in the homes. I don't have to take care of my girl children anymore, all right? She already moved into her home, all right? So I will just cater to the one or two that I have already. Someone that is responsible for. So they do not calculate the consequences the issue of further abuse that's going to take place. They just look at the immediate, the immediate assistance, that is the removal of the gear from under their control, where they do not have to take care, they don't have food, they don't have clothing and what have you that someone is taking care. So the, the issue of the further abuse that will take place, because when you go into another home uh, where this child has not fully grown, she's not developed, she doesn't have skills, 
she's only there at the mercy of the, of the perpetrator. Yes, so it's, it is an alarming situation and I think we all uh, need to put our feet down on the ground to do more, not only to talk about it, but to be able to target the most vulnerable families. Mm -hmm. you know? That's what I'm still talking about. How can families be in power? The issue of, uh, yes, we have a Ministry of Social Protection here. How then they themselves too can be able to bring social protection program to be able to, to tackle the most vulnerable families so that uh, they will not be pushed to, to give their children in, in, into early marriage. Absolutely. And I, I'm so glad that you mentioned the way that many people don't think about child marriage as abuse or, you know, as our organization focuses on sexual abuse, we see this as also an issue of sexual abuse because, of course, there's a physical relationship that's um, or a physical abuse is the better term that's happening um, within that marriage and just just continues forward. So I do think it's something that um, even more and more groups who are or advocates who are fighting sexual abuse need to be speaking up about this. What do you think? What do you think needs to be uh, done? Obviously, a large question to make progress on the child marriage problem. Clearly, it's such a global issue. It's tied in with poverty. It's tied in with um, you know, education access and so many different factors. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what some solutions might look like? Yes, I, I, yes, I do have a I do, I do have some tangible solutions, and I think if we can pursue those recommendations, we will be able to to go a mighty long way. And the very first thing is um, for each, almost all around there in Africa and the rest of the world, including Liberia. We, we, we have signed the UNCRC. The UNCRC says that you cannot have sex with anybody below the age of 18. So I think, and besides that, we, we have domesticated it. You know, it's part of our, of our law. So the way for, first of all, is to ensure that we put this into practice. And by doing this, I mean, anytime we hear about child marriage somewhere, whether it's family member, whether it's community, we as mandatory child reporters, the fact that it affects children, we should be able to report this to the police so that they can be pursued in the court of law. Mm -hmm. And with this, whether people will compromise, but we should also raise our voices as this case is being pursued. I think that is the way to start and make it, make it a policy issue that yes, we as a government, you know, we have to make sure that this particular portion of the UNRC, this particular portion of the Liberian Children Law, which says that you cannot have sex with anybody below the age of 18, we can put it into practice. That's the very first thing. The law, law, we have the law, we should make sure that the law works. The second thing we need to do is, while we're pushing for the laws to work, uh, we should increase awareness. You know, Increasing the awareness, uh, first of all, to, to, to children themselves. Yes, that the, the place for children is not in marriage, you know, but marriage will come later. The very first thing is you need to go to school, you know, and by doing this, as we're increasing the awareness, we should make sure that the schools are available and conducive for children, you know, because when we're talking about children should not be getting married, the place for them should be in school. And then they, if there are bottlenecks for them to go to school, then it affects the campaign. So we should use the school as the alternative, you know? If a school is the alternative, then it must be available. And not only available, it must be accessible for children to go and remain in school. Then the last one now we can talk about is to be able to, I know it's not possible to normally, you bring, you see all of these policies about eradicating poverty. Yes, it's difficult, but my suggestion is, let us be able to address poverty, especially the most vulnerable in the villages where we found the situation being manifested on a daily basis. You know? Let us engage family members in, into meaningful ventures. You know? it's, it's not possible that everyone will go to school and graduate from the university, but it's very possible that everyone can do something for the living. And by that, 
As we're talking about life skill, we should also back it up with vocational skill training so that family will have a livelihood and they will not be looking up to their children as a means of support. Children are not breadwinners. We should not be asking the children for their bride price. We should not be giving children out so that uh, when they go into marriage, they will bring money back. That's, that's, that should not be. As we, as we get this message, we also tell them that, look, there is an alternative. The children should be in school, but you yourself, you need skills. You do not, you did not go to school as well, but you need skills. You can, you, we can empower you to be able to do agriculture. You can get yourself in small, in a business enterprise. So the moment they themselves, they are engaged, you know, their time is no longer being idle. You find out that they will not be depending on the children. And then if we come back two, three years to do an assessment, you will realize that this whole issue of child marriage will be reduced to a very minimal level. So I think we need to look at the three from our recommendations, which will help us not only in Liberia, but also in the world, you know, to be able to address why we say it's cultural issues, but the cultural issues are tied to social protection and economic issues as well. Oh, absolutely. I think this that's such a great road forward of what we all need to be building towards, like you said, around around the world, those solutions would just go such a long way. Um, for my for my last question, I would love to ask, what do you think are the most important principles for preventing child abuse? Like, do you have any advice for whether it's policies but also maybe for parents, if you have any advice for parents who want to try to prevent child abuse. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I will start from the parents. Uh, you know, while we talk about the policy issue, but we need to start at the grassroots level. And the very first thing for parents is to recognize that uh, children are human beings, uh, that children are no, they are not your properties. You know, the same rights that you have, children have those rights. We do agree, we reinforce those rights. We say, yeah, children have responsibilities, when you send your child to school, the responsibility is for them to take their lessons to learn and work up you. But you as a parent, you must send your child to school. So the problem with child abuse issues is it starts from the home. We as parents will ensure that children are protected because if we recognize that children should be protected, then when we see an oxalus coming in into their space, we'll be able to raise the red flag. But once parents don't see children as human beings or they see them as property, they will pay little attention. So we as parents must play a proactive role in ensuring that children are protected and that children are not breadwinners, that our job as children is to care for them, for them to develop and to grow so that they can realize their true potential. Mm -hmm. The other recommendations I would make is for policies makers. Yes, we talk most of the time that children are part of the agenda. I agree, but for me to, for them to really convince me that children are part of the agenda, they have to put it into reality. And the way to put it into reality is that you have to increase funding on the on educational budget. You have to increase funding on the social protection budget. You have to increase spending on, on, on the health budget. When we begin to do these things as policy makers, then I'll realize then that children are part of the agenda. But in most instances, children lack social protection services. And children cannot assess, assess those services that will enable them to, 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 real, to realize their true potentials. Then beyond that, at the global level, yes, most, most of the issues have been addressed at the, at the global level in dealing with issues of children. But it's about time that globally that will form movements and partnerships so that we all can be able to speak with one voice. When we speak with one voice, our governments will begin to hear all the things on corrective measures. If we begin to do all of that, uh, we will be moving with just one mission in ensuring that our society, that our wounds are fit for children. And when our society and wounds are fit for children, then we can be assured of a better tomorrow. Oh, thank you so much, Alvin. This is not only helpful, but also gives me some hope and especially hope that there's people like you out there who are advocating for children and anyone listening or watching this on YouTube, uh, check out the African Network for the Prevention and Protection Against Child Abuse and Neglect. I'll put a link, as I said, um, they're a fantastic organization to support. Um, so I hope that you all do. 
Thank you so much, Alvin. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day and keep up the good work. Okay. All the best. Thank you too for having me. All the best.